I'm delighted to welcome today Dr. Jill Byram, who is a menopause expert. So welcome, Jill. Hello, Elaine. I hope you're having better weather over there than we are here. <laughs> Well, I've, I've got uh, sunshine. It's not warm, but it's not cold. You can see I'm, I'm actually, it's, it's, it's what I call cardigan weather. It's sort of spring UK weather here in Neil Garden, Portugal, where I'm speaking from. So I have no complaints at all. Um, but we have had about five days of non-stop rain. So I'm catching up on the washing and all that sort of stuff. But um, when you put the washing on the line here, by the time the next load is ready, the first lot is dried. So I've really got no complaints at all. So, so <laughs> well, you've got rain, have you? And, and uh, yeah, it's a bit grim. Set. Although we have had one of the best Novembers so far, I think. The, you know, it, it, we've had some glorious days. So I, I never moan. And the trees are absolutely beautiful. That's what I do miss. There's no lush green fields and no, no, you know, autumnal colours in the trees and things here. It's a, it's either lush green with the uh, lemons and oranges and avocado trees olive trees all that sort of stuff um, and with clover they don't really have grass it's more like clover um, yes but i do miss that anyway there we go so we've anyway. done another report <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry about that guys <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk let's talk about um, lady bits and menopause and um hormonal changes and and um thinking you're going mad and what have we so so, so talk to us about all things menopause Jill. Well, what do you want to know first? Well, so many, so many women um, I hear complaining and bitching and moaning and oh my God, it's, you know, this, this menopause, if only it wasn't the menopause and how terrible I am and poor me and I'm a victim and this, that and the other. Um, and I get really crossed about it because in my view, if you are healthy and a strong immune system, and everything is in balance then you're unlikely to have menopausal effects because from my knowledge and understanding i'm not a medical expert by any means but my knowledge and understanding and the number of people i've interviewed are all kind of saying the same thing so i don't know if you're going to agree or disagree with this so we shall see where we go <laughs> if, you're, if you're if you're kind of pretty balanced in your health and well-being before your body decides that it's going to change hormonally because it's your body that decides all these things not not us as such and um, then you're less likely to have symptoms but if you're in a bit of a state and, and in the pickle and you you might not even know that you might not know that your body is in a, in a dodgy state um, then you're more likely to have some symptoms and depending upon your behavior which is my expertise if your behavior is such your behavior pattern is such that you're more kind of gentle, introverted, soft kind of sort of person, you'll then start to think, oh, it's me, it's me, and you worry yourself, and every slight niggle is a menopausal thing, and oh, I'm, I'm going mad, I'm losing my mind, so, and so it escalates. Um, and then, it, and it's, it's, I find it very sad, because I think a lot of women typically will kind of lose part of their life, you know, they'll lose maybe up to 10 years, perhaps, perhaps more for some people. So. I've got very strong views on it based upon my own experience and as you probably would expect I had no symptoms whatsoever I didn't even didn't I stopped my period the week before I had a mastectomy which was very convenient I didn't have all that mess and muck um, at the age of 52 so I had my last period then and I've had no symptoms whatsoever no 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 problems um, so I speak from experience and I know I'm more unusual than most people because i'm hearing people say the same things so that's that that's my viewpoint which i hadn't intended to bring out so early but uh, <laughs> uh, correct me or guys guide me you know let's let's uh, let's uh, uh, inform the listeners on uh, what your view is as an expert in, in menopausal matters well um i am um, just to say that i am although i'm a doctor still but i'm an honorary doctor but i am a former nurse and I've been working in the kind of complementary and alternate fields for many years. And, you know, I've always used natural and alternate, alternate medicines ever since I was probably 19, actually, which is now 40 years ago, I went to a naturopath in Harley Street. I was probably one of the first people that ever used a natural path, you know, in 1980 or whatever it was. So I'm very much embroiled in uh, the convent, the, the difference between conventional approaches, the allopathic approach, and the alternate approach. 
And so throughout all of my time, you know, I, I was a nurse, I then did all sorts of other things and then came back into the healthcare and well-being business when I had my own physical breakdown uh, eight, nine years ago, something like that. And so it's been a bit of an exploratory journey, really. I'm very nosy. And so I want to know, I think like you as well, mm -hmm. you know, I do a lot of research and I, I listen to lots of people and uh over the years, it's been interesting that my opinions of things have gradually changed because our opinions change anyway, don't they, Elaine, as we as we get older. And so although I agree with you to a certain extent, um, you know, if you look at the work of somebody like Garbo Marte, for example, he says that the etiology of disease, all of it is based on past trauma. So whether or not that shows up as a breast cancer or as menopausal symptoms, because those are the two things that we've mentioned, is that you know, we've all got things that we may be, as you say, unaware of that are affecting the energy in the cells in our body. That means that we become more susceptible to that dis-ease that almost is the one that we're more susceptible to or because of a personality trait, for example. Um, and I remember reading Dr. Garba Mate about breast cancer, for example, um, and about uh, melanoma, skin cancer. And he, for example, says that skin cancer very much is, a, is a, um, a sign that somebody has been repressed in their life. And my mother had malignant melanoma and her whole story was about repression and suppression you know, at the hands of, um, of uh, the hands of my father. And it, so it's not as simple as, you know, there's a cause and effect, mm -hmm. but of course we've got all sorts of other things. As a functional nutritionist, we also know that the way that we look after ourselves in terms of our food has a massive impact too. And one of the worrying things about what goes on with allopathic medicine is that lots of women, it's a bit like what's going on with uh, the current situation, is that women live in fear of, for example, developing a breast cancer because they've heard there's a gene and they may even have the gene in their family. Uh, and they therefore think that because you have this gene that you are therefore going to go on and have that dis-ease. And if you think about it logically, that would mean that every woman that has the BRCA gene would end up with breast cancer and that simply isn't true. So what we do know is that these genes switch on and they switch off in the same way that symptoms switch on and switch off. And I think probably like you, Elaine, you know, I like to describe it like a dashboard in the car. You know, we all know that we've got a warning signal uh, on your dashboard. And so, you, you know, in your car, you go and fill up with petrol or you go and put water in the windscreen wipers when it tells you to do that. But we're not quite as good as doing that with our bodies. So we might get a signal, for example, if we talk about menopause symptoms, a woman might have a signal that, you know, she gets really bad PMS. And she'll put up with that PMS maybe for 20 years, mm -hmm. thinking that that's normal, mm -hmm. that this is to be expected because, you know, as women, we put up with a lot, don't we? We put up with a lot physically. For goodness sake, we make a whole being <laughs> and birth it <laughs> in whatever way you have. You happen to be able to do that. And I didn't do that very well, by the way. So what happens, I think, with the menopause is that, yes, we have the opportunity to reduce menopause symptoms if we can address that mind, body, soul. And I had spent years and years and years addressing the mind, that sorry, the body, a bit of it with functional nutrition with you know I teach Pilates um, I am um, careful about what I eat I take supplements and have done for years and years and years but for me I had probably one of the worst menopauses that I know of anybody of the 40 symptoms that I have on my website on my website checker I probably had 37 of them yeah. And so despite all of the interventions that I was doing, going to every alternate and alternate and complementary therapist, you name it, I've had it. I still wasn't able to get on top of the worst symptoms for me, 
which were the night sweats, hot flashes, and the, the consequent insomnia. So basically I was an insomniac for 30 year, 13 years. You know, I would, if I slept for two hours at a time, then I was doing quite well. You know, I haven't dreamed for 13 years because I never went deep enough into a sleep. And what we know is that, you know, if you don't have sleep, that is actually more dangerous and more life-threatening and shortening than probably anything else. And certainly uh, if you look at the beneficial effects or the, the, the risks and, and, and dangers of uh, HRT, for example. So for every woman, what we want to be able to do is to balance the risks of what her lifestyle is like, what interventions can be done in, th in terms of a natural, from a natural approach, and at what point and whether we ne all need to add in or fill the gaps with the very essential things that we are missing in terms of the depletion in hormones, which is essentially what's happening in the menopause. And Elaine, I've had a massive wake up call on this <laughs> because for all those 13 years I was convinced that everything that I was doing was um, was going to be able to help me overcome these massive symptoms let alone the knock-on effects of being postmenopausal and the risks to uh, things like heart disease osteoporosis Alzheimer's with the withdrawal of estrogen which is what protects us and it's really interesting that you, you talk about immunity because I was reading something yesterday. I think this is a study in The Lancet about the fact that women are more protected from COVID-19 because at the premenopausally because of the beneficial effects of oestrogen. Oh, interesting. You learn something new every day. Yes. So what we do know is that, for example, oestrogen protects us from heart disease. So, you know, when I was nursing, you'd see men in hospital with heart attacks at 45 and 50. Women didn't have heart attacks at 45 or 50. Women have heart attacks at 60 and 65. And this is because oestrogen has this protective effect because we have oestrogen receptors all over the body. And this is why, you know, a lot of the time, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the figures are, but, you know, women become more susceptible to Alzheimer's and dementia, too. So it's looking at this as the bigger picture, not only about symptomatic relief. We want to also take away because, I, you know, what I was doing a bit of the same as you. I had a bit of a pity party because it had gone on for so years, so many years. I was blaming myself. I was blaming my body. This my body is letting me down because that's what it felt like. But of course, as my journey has progressed and I've got more into the awakening journey of realizing that actually my spirit and my soul has a massive effect uh, into what I'm attracting into my life, then I've, I've had a rethink. So there's a bit of a two pronged com conversation that's been going on here. One is my realization that my past affects my future. And also that there are just some things that will never get better or that will never um, be solved unless I accept the fact that I have a massive depletion in estrogen. And this is similar to a massive depletion in magnesium, for example, because we know we don't get it from our food, in vitamin D, because here not you but here particularly you know we don't get enough sun from april to october some october to april and it's the same deficiency as a thyroxine deficiency uh, or a, a an insulin deficiency you know this is a hormone and and so traditionally it's acceptable for women to take thyroxine and for people to take insulin but it's not been acceptable for many years now for women to fill the gap with a little bit of estrogen couple of reasons for that. One is because of the scare stories that were perpetrated by a study done in 2001 and 2002. And we can talk about that if you want. But the other thing is that, you know, years ago, 100, 150 years ago, women went into the menopause slightly later. So now the average age of the last day of the period, which is what menopause actually means, is 51. But years ago, it would have been more like 54, 56. But of course, 150, 200 years ago, we were only living till we were 59, you know, on average. Now, if you look at it, and, this, and you referred to this already, 
if we're going into the menopause in our 40s, and, and the majority of women do, menopause lasts over the period at 40, 51. We are post-menopausal, therefore, for 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years. That's half of our life. We are living without the beneficial effects of oestrogen because we might now live till, you know, 101. And so as our world has changed, our lifestyle has changed, uh, so has our, my particular approach has changed to that because I realized that a lot of the symptoms that I was having, um, I was putting up with because we're very good at putting up with things. And actually for the sake of weighing up the pros and cons, since I've been taking a little bit of estradiol gel, <laughs> which is two pumps a day, which is about the equivalent to, I don't know, one contraceptive pill in a year. And I was on the pill for many years. What was my problem? What was my problem about this? It's a personal decision for me, uh, but actually doing a lot of the research and understanding the distress and the, the lack of self-esteem and self-worth in women, uh, you know, they feel like their, their life is ruined. They're seeing in black and white rather than, than in colour. And I know that we can't give HRT to everybody, and I'm not really here even specifically to talk about that alone. But it has to be a balancing act between quality of life and quantity of life and mitigating the risks in other senses. And if you like, we can talk about the risks and, and benefits of HRT. So the... You, you mentioned the pump. Um, so is that an HRT thing that you take? Yes, because I had a hysterectomy at 45, uh, I just need to take oestrogen. I don't need progesterone. So for every other woman, if you have a womb, you have to take oestrogen and progesterone. And you'll understand the reason for that because in a normal cycle, your first two weeks is dominated by oestrogen and the second two weeks is dominated by progesterone. And so the womb builds up ready for a pregnancy for the first two weeks. If it doesn't happen, oestrogen drops and progesterone takes over and eventually you shed the lining of the womb. So if you didn't have that progesterone, then the, the womb wouldn't shed. <laughs> so you can't have a build up with just taking oestrogen if you've got a womb. That's the simple way of thinking about that. So. The old forms of oestrogen are pill types and there are still women that take pills and I'm not quite sure why, to be honest, because the new form formulations, the new body identical or body uh, bioidentical, their body identical really hormones that have been produced over the last few years uh, in the form of patches, gels and sprays, they are much more... Um, bioavailable because they are taken through the skin. In other words, they don't have to be taken and go through the liver. The liver does about 600 things, as you know, and, and so, you know, you, you, you don't want to bombard it with any sort of medication, really, if you can help it, <laughs> uh, because it's already doing a fantastic job. But also the risks of HRT seem to be less, far less, with something that goes through your skin or transdermal, as they call it. The other thing that's happened is that they have developed a micronized progesterone from yams. So this is a this is a, na a more natural um, approach to this as well. Micronized means it's just built put into little bits, you know, tiny bits, so it can be absorbed. So basically, for the majority of women now who go to the GP, they should, if they are being if they are asking for HRT and being prescribed it, the majority of women should be given transdermal HRT because it is safer. Very interesting. Well, I apologise publicly now to those people that I've been thinking, oh, poor you, poor you, stop your pity party. So, um, <laughs> but I did acknowledge that, you know, there's things in the body that we don't know what's happening. So you are the first person to have explained it so clearly. So thank you so much, Jill. Um, it makes perfect sense. And um, it's quite humbling to realise that it's just, it's, it's it's almost simple to fix isn't it it's almost like too easy yeah so let's explore the risk uh benefit risk thing because hrt um oh, it's it's to me it's been abhorrent some of the stories i've heard about uh, people yeah. and the side effects of hrt but as you've explained it's now a lot kinder and a lot more yes 
Um, Yams is the uh, progesterone from Yams. Is there a wh wh where does HRT come from? How how is it made? Where, where, where is, what's the source? So so the HR so the old HRT, which is the one that that's kind of got the bad press, is is called Premarin. That's one of the forms, and that's made from uh, horses' wee. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so a lot of the tests or the, the, the study that all of the scaremongering is based on was done in 2001, 2002. And actually it was a flawed study in the first place because it was done with women who were already over the age of 60 yeah. and women who um, were had other comorbidities. So in other words, we've all heard this phrase now because we've all become experts, haven't we, about <laughs> medical terms. Uh, so they might have heart disease or they were overweight or they smoked or they drank or whatever. Um, and so this was flagged as this massive thing. And loads of women at that time, believe it or not, GPs were quite happy to give HRT. There were loads of women on it. At that point, there was this mass exodus. I had my hysterectomy um, 15 years ago. So I don't know when that was, 2005, something like that. And there was another flag at that point because, you know, Elaine, bad news sells, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Good news doesn't sell, bad news sells. And we see this on our mainstream media every day. Everybody's watching the news because bad news sells. Another million people, you know, have, you know, been tested, not got, but been tested, you know? And so it's bad news, bad news, bad news. And it keeps us in this state. And of course it becomes addictive as well. So that, at that point, I came off. Now, I was actually on Everol, an Everol patch. My GP was very enlightened. And even 15 years ago, I wasn't given a pill. I was given an Everol patch that I put on my bottom. And I changed it every, uh, twice a week, something like that. But I came off it because I was one of those women that went, oh, I'm really scared about this. And over the years, the, uh, the awareness has grown. Uh, NICE, which is the kind of overarching um, organisation that deals with uh, drug administration and protocols that GPs can follow, have published a, an article or a, a guidelines, the NICE guidelines, which I think are number 28 on their website and you can look at them. And there are very now very clear guidelines to GPs about the safety and efficacy and long term benefits as well of HRT and the types of HRT that they should be giving. So uh, the ones that are now being formed are as close to uh, the, the process of the, the way that we process it. We can't, I don't think we can access estrogen from, you know, uh, a plant. I mean, I know this as a functional nutritionist, we like to talk about soy and phytoestrogens. I don't think it's as simple as that. I'm not an expert in that. I'm not a scientist. I do know that the, the, the new formulations are more body identical and therefore bioavailable and, and able to be absorbed. But what I wanted to, to, to look at is, you know, the big worry is about breast cancer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a study and you can look at this. I think I've probably got this on my website or, um, you know, you can come and join my Facebook group. Uh, and there is this wonderful diagram that is right in your face. And when I saw this diagram, that was my kind of wake up moment. So in the diagram, it says, uh, I might just be wrong here, but I think it's something like 12 women out of a thousand women per year are diagnosed with breast cancer. If a woman takes HRT, transdermal HRT, that number goes up by three. So that would be, what did I say, 15 out of a thousand. These figures aren't completely accurate. It's, it's something like 12 or 15, something like that. But it, it's three more women. If she smokes, it's four more women. If she drinks alcohol every day, it's three more women. If she is obese, it is 12 more women. So it's double the amount. However, if she takes just estrogen, HRT, it's three women less. If she exercises for 30 minutes a day, three times a week, it's seven less. Do you see where I'm going here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you are more at risk. And of course, sleep will be a massive thing as well. Mm -hmm. So if you are a smoker, a drinker, you don't sleep very well and you don't have a very good diet and you're obese, you are 
many more times at risk of breast cancer or any other disease than you are of taking a couple of little pumps of an estradiol gel or putting a patch on your bum. And living a, a, a full life. Yeah, and not feeling that your life is over, that you want to kill your family. <laughs> you can't find your keys, you know, um, and your hair's falling out. And, and can I tell you that, you know, what happened to me, this piff, pivotal moment happened in January this year. I went skiing, go skiing every year. And I realised that the, we always drive. And the drive down was so uncomfortable. I couldn't sit still. And I was beginning to, you know, just be a bit kind of smelly and realizing that I was kind of, there was a bit of an old lady we smell occasionally around. And I was thinking, because I'm a Pilates teacher, I've had cesarean sections, I have a very good pelvic floor. And I was thinking, what is going on here? I don't understand this. But it was that journey when I thought, you know, I'm so uncomfortable. I don't really want to wear trousers, you know, and, and I've, thinking about it I'd worn skirts every time I travel probably for the last five years I've always chosen to wear a skirt without really wondering why and I met a lady and started presenting at some uh, events and we got talking about vaginal atrophy and there was this light bulb moment thinking oh my god I didn't know about vaginal atrophy. I'm a former nurse. I'm a functional nutritionist. I'm a Pilates teacher. I didn't even know there was such a thing. And so when I started looking into it, and this pharmacist lady actually looked at me and she said, what you mean you've been putting up with this for years and you haven't done anything about it? You know, get real. You need to sort this out. And it's so easily done. So do you know what vaginal, vagina, I presume you know what vaginal atrophy is? I think for the, I do, yes. I think for the benefit of the, the listeners, um, you better Let's explain it, shall we? Yeah. Okay. So as we get older, there are a number of things that happen to us. And the one of the, the beneficial of things about estrogen is it is it's, it keeps us moist. Mm. So moist in terms of our skin, of our hair, of our nails, uh, of our external and will also our internal organs. And for some women, as your skin dries out and your hair dries out, so do your urogenital parts. So it's not only vaginal atrophy, actually, it's atrophy of the whole bowl that sits underneath there. So it can affect the vagina, it can affect the back packet passage, and it can also affect the ureter, which is the bit that you pee out of the front, because it's all really close together, anatomy-wise, it's close together. And it also affects the vulva, which is the outside part of the vagina. I know we look at people and say, oh, she's got a nice vagina or that's a whatever vagina. That's not the vagina. The vagina is a bit in the inside. What we're actually looking at is the pudendum at the front and the vulval um, flaps underneath. So what happens is things dry out. That area dries out as well. Not only does it dry, but it shortens as well. So it's atrophies. That's what atrophy means. So as the vagina closes and shortens, so can the ureter at the front because it's all attached. And so can it affect you know, what's happening behind as well. So the symptoms of people with vagina atrophy, and there's a very annoying uh, <laughs> advert on here at the moment about have you got a little itch down there, which drives me a bit crazy because I can, I can assure you it's more than a little itch. Basically, you get symptoms of discomfort. Some women, um, the vagina actually shrinks so much if it's not treated that the vaginal will fuse together. This is the extreme part of it. The vulva gets dried and shriveled. The clitoris is affected as well. It's no wonder that women go off sex, either because they, it's, sex is physically impossible, because it feels like knives. You know, women describe it like um, really sharp knives, you know, uh, razor blades. Mm -hmm. Uh, because as the vagina shrinks, so does also the moistness disappear as well. And it's not good enough just to use some KY jelly. And we'll talk about that. So what's happening here is the direct effect of the lack of estrogen in this area. And the other thing that happens, of course, is that women then start to leak. So or they might get what feels like urinary tract infections. A lot of women describe to me it feels like they're on the verge of thrush all the time, but then it'll go away. This is all symptoms of vaginal atrophy. The vulva can be, will shrink and can turn into um, other bacterial 
uh, conditions as well if you leave this alone if you're not looking at this as a flashing light then it will just progress and get worse so the way that we deal with this is a topical estrogen it doesn't matter and i've you know i've talked to women for years about using things like uh, omega-7 omega-7 is a uh, sea buckthorn is a really good way of helping uh, those kind of bodily tissues but what I realized in the end that was there was no amount of nutritional therapy or topical um, application that you could put on in this area that was going to restore the function the natural function of the vagina whether or not you want to have penetrative sex or not it's not that's not what we're talking about and so what we know now is that, you know, for a long time, they've devised creams and pessaries, tiny little pessaries, you know, less than the size of a, um, a paracetamol, which you put up through into a, an applicator, a skinny applicator. And this delivers, delivers estrogen directly to where it's needed. So this means that even if you have had breast cancer, even if you have the BRCA gene, even if you're worried that you... Um, don't want to take HRT but you have vaginal atrophy you can safely take Bagifem or the estrogen equivalent as a cream because it doesn't go into the bloodstream it literally stays in that area and that's brilliant news for a lot of people but unfortunately that still is for a lot of uh, GPs and even gynecologists and obstetricians they are not familiar that this is actually the case so a lot of women are being turned away and one of the saddest things, Elaine, is that because we now know we have an aging population, for me, you know, we've got women sitting in, uh, in their homes, particularly during lockdown now, ladies in their 70s and 80s in nursing homes, who have repeated kind of urinary or long-term embedded urinary tract infections that I'm guessing the majority would be from vaginal atrophy or from neurogenital atrophy. And if they were just given a little bit, a little pessary twice a week of some Vagifem, then a lot of their symptoms would go away. Well, how interesting. We could we could talk about this for days on end. There's so many things that you've said that we could, you know, have a, have another podcast on. Um, Vagifem, is that a, a, is it natural? Is it... Um, is it Bagifem is, is an estradiol so yes it's one of the ones that is more bio identical or bio um, but um, the thing about Vagifem and there is a as you know I do a, a podcast myself called the Radiant Menopause podcast and I interviewed a, a GP who has a private clinic in Harley Street here in London and she's a menopause expert sadly most of most GPs aren't interested or don't want to know or are ignorant about it but she explained to me, we, I questioned her about Vagifem. So you have a loading dose of Vagifem for two weeks and then you drop to two, two a week. For most women, two a week is fine. You can take more than that. Some women have to take it five times a week or even more, but two is about standard. And if you were to take two Vagifem little pessaries for a whole year, that's the thing that is the same as taking one contraceptive pill it's such a tiny amount and of course women don't question the contraceptive pill <laughs> you know i didn't when i went on it it was just oh here we go you know thank god for that we don't question those amounts of hormones that we're putting into our bodies and so it's getting the perception right of saying okay let's get this let's really work out what's going on here so it's a prescription though although in spain you can buy it and in fact interestingly my very best friend lives in spain in oliva and she won't mind me telling you this she's been using vagifrem for a while and buys it over there because uh, she doesn't speak spanish and you know she has a language difficulty so she just buys her vagifrem and she's been having real problems for years and eventually i told her the other day go and get yourself some estradiol gel and uh, so she did that and she phoned me and she has palpitations. She's had palpitations for years. And, I, you know, she works with me with my nutritional therapy stuff. <laughs> and she phoned me last night and she said, you know, this, this thing that I take, I, I take a particularly heart, um, a heart health drug or a, it's a liquid, actually. It's a um, it's called proarginine and it opens the arteries and reverses biological aging. And she said, could, could, that, could that cause palpitations? And I said, well, no, that's helping your heart. And she said, oh, well, they've gone away. And literally, I said, so when did you start taking your pumps? And she said, five days ago. And within five days, 
her palpitations have gone away. And this is what I found with two of my pumps of gel. Because initially I went to look at having Vagifem and then when I started doing my research about oestrogen and got over myself, that's when I went into my GP. I was completely empowered. I was ready for a fight because I was warned that they wouldn't want to give it to me. I had this wonderful young lady and I went in with my nice guidelines and I'd done my research on the back of the nice guidelines and written, I'd like some oestrogel gel pump please and I'd like some Vagifem. I'd done my blood pressure and I knew how much I weighed that morning and uh, I was in and out in seven minutes with what I wanted. Brilliant. That is that is empower, empowerment to the nth degree, isn't it? Good for you. That, that's absolutely fabulous. pro nine. Um, I used to run cardiovascular health clinics uh, when I was in England and um, I used to recommend pro nine, which is very good for cardiovascular health. Um, yes. Absolutely. So is, is there a test, Jill, for oestrogen? How do women know the level of oestrogen apart from symptoms? And obviously we want to be proactive here rather than wait until we've got symptoms. So That's a really good question, really good question. So what happens when you um, go into the menopause? So for the majority of women, that will be in your 40s. But one in 1,000 women, sorry, one in 100 women will go into the menopause in their 30s. And one in 1,000 women will go into their menopause in their 20s. So, you know, that has a massive effect. If you just think about that at the moment and the, the, the trend that we have at the moment, and, you know, uh, my daughters are, you know, my eldest daughter is 31, for delaying pregnancy, you know, there is a little bit of a clue as to when your mum went into menopause as to when you're likely to go into it. But, you know, we do have a big problem with infertility nowadays because women are leaving their families later. So just be aware, really aware of that. And that's why I think, you know, it's easy for women to say, well, I don't need to think about the menopause because I'm only in my 30s. I had my first flush at 39. And I'm not uncommon at all. So basically what happens when your estrogen levels and your progesterone levels start fluctuating, which is what happens in the perimenopause period, which is the, the, the bit up to the last day of your period, your estrogen's dropping. So other things kind of kick in to try and compensate for that. And one of those is something called FH, FH, FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. So when you go to the GP, if you are under the age of 45, they might offer you a blood test. And that's what they're looking for. Because at, up to about that age, and of course, you know, now you know that we all go into this at different points. It's just a you know, it's one of those, oh, we'll do it 45. If you're 46, you can't have it. If you're 45, you can, you know. So what they're looking for is if you have high levels of follicle stimulating hormone, it's the body's kind of attempt at making up for the drop in estrogen, which is an, which is an indication that you are in the perimenopausal period. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it does make sense. Yeah. However, over 45, it's deemed that it's unnecessary. To be honest with you, I think it's unnecessary anyway, because if you understand that the majority of women, apart from the one in a hundred and the one in a thousand, will have their menopause between average age of 51, that means that pretty much all women will be in the perimenopausal period in their 40s, because the perimenopause can last from seven to 14 years. It's a long time. It just doesn't go all oh, one day I'm fertile and everything's fine. And the next day I'm, you know, or a year later, it, it's a long, slow decline. It's not like puberty where that happens quite quickly. You know, if you look at the graph, that goes up quite quickly. The, the, the way that it declines is really, really slow as these estrogen and progesterones decline. It takes a long time. So what's really interesting, and it's a great question, is because like me and like the majority of women that I see, when they go to their doctor and say they have depression or anxiety, or they have joint pain, or they have tinnitus, or they have headaches or migraines, or they have bloating, or they have dry skin, or their hair's falling out, or they are feeling underconfident, or they um, wanna kill their kids, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. The doctor, because that's what he's trained to do, will look at that symptom, treat that symptom, diagnose that symptom and treat that symptom. And at one point, somebody might go, oh, 
Of course, this might have something to do with the menopause. In my opinion, if a 40 plus woman goes into the doctor with any of those, mm -hmm. the first thing that should be thought of is this woman is menopausal. And therefore, the approach is different because it's got to be you know, what you and I do is this holistic approach is not looking at the one thing that's wrong, but looking at the underlying cause. And you're right from your very first introduction is that the basis of my help, despite the fact that I now am a, I'm a bit converted to HRT, HRT in and of itself is not going to cure or make everything totally better. You can't eat crap and not exercise and smoke and drink and do all the rest of it and expect HRT to make you feel good. The basis of the way that I work is not symptomatic relief, but it is building health. And that building health comes in a mind, body, soul approach. So it's giving the body the opportunity to come back into balance, both from a functional uh, sort of medicine sort of way in terms of physicality, but also in terms of a mind way. And this is where mindfulness, meditation, all of those kind of spiritual, not Christian, <laughs> but spiritual practices. And I see so many women that are of my age that have come to realize they're not even putting a name on it but they're realizing that actually there is more to life than the day-to-day -day bubble 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 and that they need to take time for themselves they might just sit and knit in a corner that's the same as my meditation for 10 minutes you know they may take the dog out for a walk that is the same thing we get in touch with what we need as women as we get older which i believe is one of the biggest benefits and that's the time at which we need to take most self-care Absolutely. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I'm, I'm a conversion person or whatever you call it there to, um, <laughs> to HRT because I've been so against any any drug interference whatsoever because my mum died of um, uh, the effect of so many drugs she was on for this that, and the other thing because her generation um, she would have been nearly 90 now, but uh, she, I, I lost her five years ago um, and she was on HRT for years. And because when that scare happened, um, she came off of HRT and she said that she's never she was never well. She after that. felt wonderful on HRT. So she came off and then drug after drug after drug was prescribed for various different symptoms. Yeah. Because um, in those days, that's you know, you listen to your doctor and doctor knows best, but of course there's there's far more now that we know that doctors don't know. You've mentioned a doctor earlier on. Um can you spell the name of this? I've never heard of this person, but Gabba Marte? Gabba Marte, yeah. So Gabba Marte is a, a physician, he's Canadian, and his work is really interesting. He is a trauma expert. So you can look at, he's on YouTube uh, all over the place. How are you spelling his name, Jill? I can't, can't G-A-B-O-R. G-A-B-O-R, Gabor. M-A-T-E. M-A-T-E, thank you. So he's a trauma expert and he basically, his, his, a lot of his work started with addictions. And, you know, we have lot, make lots of judgments with people with, who are addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever, or food, sugar, you know, sugar is actually the biggest addiction that we have. In fact, I, I do a, an addiction nutrition program uh, talking about, you know, people who come off heroin and then get addicted to sugar and it's actually more, more addictive. But he, you know, this is about changing our perception of how powerful our past experiences are. And he said in all his years working in the slums in Canada, in I can't remember which uh, city he worked in, of all the addicts that he worked with, none of them, uh, or all of them, I should say, had, had, had suffered some form of physical or sexual abuse as a child. Every single one of them. And so although, you know, I, was, I did an interview yesterday with my friend who is a, an advanced hypnotherapist and what she does is a lot of regression therapy. It's a really interesting interview, actually. And she coming at it from a very different angle identifies the same thing is that, you know, although regression therapy sounds a bit scary because you're remembering horrible things that went to you, you're not because it's the subconscious mind that she's tapping into. So it, something might flash in front of you, but it's gone again. But everybody that she treats or that she helps to overcome whatever it is that is happening with them, all of that is based on past experience. 
And if you understand the work of Joe Dispenser, Dr. Joe Dispenser, he's really interesting too. Yeah, brilliant. He explains how our personality is made up of things that we are have experienced in the past. So all of the stuff that we base our future on is based on our past experiences. So in other words, living in the past means that we've become fearful of the future. And of course, we're seeing this at the moment because we've had past experience of COVID, for example, and how bad this is. So we're being tapped into that. Oh, it was really bad. It was really bad. All these people died. Da, 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 da. So let's feed on that because that's inevitable that that's going to happen again. And that's a bit like the HRT thing. You know, we were told that years ago HRT was dangerous so we keep that in our brains because that's our past experience so in order for us to change our personal reality of what we believe and what we don't believe and you've you you've just demonstrated that we have to change the reality of it we have to be open to actually what is really the facts and myths and it's really difficult in this world isn't it because we have so much facts checking going on and censorship going on of what's really right and what's really wrong and people with big interests like big pharma pushing pills and vaccines at us because they know they're going to make millions and millions and trillions of money you know all of that industry we know uh, is very very controlling and so the ability, and I think this is one of the, the real benefits of being a wise woman, of being the midlife woman, is that we can actually tap back into our sense of intuition and gut feeling and take some time to really understand what is true and what is not true. And if you can't decide on yourself, find somebody who can help you. Absolutely. I've, I've written, um, I've been making lots of notes here and, I, and I, I wrote the word intuition down when we first started talking. And, and that's what I tell people that I work with um, to do. Follow your intuition. Doesn't matter what anybody tells you. Doesn't matter what I tell you. If something doesn't resonate with you, then don't do it because your, your body tells you whether you're, you know, you should be, um, whether it's taking a, a supplement or medication or going somewhere or speaking to somebody your body tells you because it it has all these emotions and um that that drives how we behave and uh, how we respond and, and so on and so forth and you know there's yes, but, um joe dispenser calls emotions energy in motion which is exactly yeah. what it is yeah and we you know we become conditioned not to tune into our bodies and that's that's what's going on at the moment is that you know so many people are questioning what is going on in the world and the figures and the propaganda and is this really true and do we really need to be locked down and even if you even if you don't believe what are being deemed as conspiracy theories which they're not incidentally in my opinion even if you don't believe in what is is the underlying kind of darkness about potentially what's happening here most people are suspicious and they go something not right there's something not right I don't know what it is but there's something not right here absolutely you've, you've mentioned a few times functional nutrition what 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 exactly is that so functional nutrition is using food as medicine so Hippocrates talked about it you know centuries ago let food be thy medicine let medicine be thy food and of course this is where all where all medication came from for example so at least 50 percent of all medication is based on food or natural herbs and remedies uh, as, as a great interview actually with a guy called the naked pharmacist on my website as on my um on my podcast as well and he explains it really well so basically it's using now we've always done this you know your granny would have given you cod liver oil <laughs> you know or um epsom salt baths or whatever it is we've always known the powers of herbs and foods and for example proarginine is a really good example of that so proarginine um, is a, a formula that's made by a company that I use to supply my, my own nutritional uh, supplements because I trust them. I've worked with them for, I don't know, 20 years, something like that. And they are the mother of supplement com 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 uh, companies, that, that and their parent company, Nature Sunshine. And basically what they've done is they've put this formulation together that it contains, called proarginine, that contains L-arginine, and another one called L-citrulline, which is a signaling molecule that was discovered in 1998 called nitric oxide, not, nitro, not nitrous oxide, the one that makes you giggle, it's nitric oxide. And basically what that does is it opens the veins up, it opens the arteries up, makes them wide open so that blood can flow more, 
you know, easily. So when we're about, you know, when we're young and up to about the age of 23, our arteries are really supple, really supple. And so that everything flows really easily. As we get older, with the effects of poor diets, stress, lack of exercise, all those things, our veins become blocked with things like calcium deposits and fatty tissues and you know, arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and the veins become stiff. So that means that this nitric oxide effect of opening the veins when we need the arteries when we need them to, to get this blood to flow where we need it. So into our hearts, in our heads, into our feet. That means that we, our circulation slows down. And if our circulation slows down, it's a bit like your engine in your car giving up. You can have the best upholstery in your car and the best wheels, but if the engine's not working, you're stuffed. <laughs> so if your engine's not working and otherwise your cardiovascular system, then all elements of your body will be affected, including your endocrine system, which is where all your hormones are made. Am I making sense? Absolutely. And when I was running my clinics, um, I have a device, which I still have actually, um, when I run health retreats, it, it comes out and I, I test your tamar, Have you got a Tamar machine? No, no, I've got a BP plus machine. Uh, all right i've had 10 years well, i've had three or four different versions so basically it assesses the ar the arterial stiffness yes. level so i have one called vital vision that sets your arterial stiffness yeah, yeah. so not from one to eight so eight is bad and one is yeah there, there, there's so many uh, I, I had one of the first ones in uh well about 12 years ago something like that and there's various different versions that have come out since but yeah um it's it's a very easy way to assess uh, people's cardiovascular but because they need to see things don't they when you see a report, brilliant particularly men did you find that elaine yeah. <laughs> they want to see the evidence you yeah. know men, men came to see me because they were with their wife and i'd say well, well you may as well be tested yourself while you're here sort of thing yeah within three months every single person within three months who was on what i call the naughty step which yeah. is way above you know the level that's acceptable um, for arterial stiffness, every single one of them, without fail, all came down and um, cleared their arteries. And some, and yet, some people would say to me, "Why would I pay you to have a private test when, if I have a stroke or a heart attack, the NHS will pick me up?" And you know, some people have that view. So I've learned over the years, you can't, you just, you just can't tell some people. All we can do is yeah. share what we know, and it's up to people to then take, it, you know, on, on board or not. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, so let me just explain then that the the because we were talking about you know pharmacology. Mm -hmm. So basically, the the signaling molecule nitric oxide is produced by this uh, l, l arginine. So this is in, and this is a natural product. I can't remember what it's from. L citrulline is from the pith of melons. I know that, but I always forget what l arginine's the base of that is. And so. What the um, pharmaceutical industry did when this was, you know, the guys that invented it were given a Nobel Prize in 1998. I mean, this is big stuff, really big stuff. And so they thought, oh, we can we can capitalize on this. And so what they realized was that if they could have a drug that opened up the arteries, uh, that would help people with heart disease, obviously. And so essentially the L-arginine, that nitric oxide is the basis of things like blood pressure tablets, statins how much money has been made out of statins yeah. and Viagra mm -hmm. because Viagra all Viagra does is it does just that it opens up the arteries to get blood to the other end. One of my clients actually uh, had a baby after taking proarginine they couldn't yeah. conceive and then he was on proarginine for a few months and then lo and behold next thing is uh, they're pregnant Wonderful. Yeah. So this is the, the thing about ProArginine and the way that I work and why I love the company is because it's not only those in it, it's got all these other things in it as well. But this is the basis of health. Rather than treating that infertility or treating that ache in the leg or whatever it might be, if you can actually go in and improve the cardiovascular system, everything improves, including your brain, your liver function, cardiovascular function, your energy levels, because you are getting more oxygen and goodness and, you know, nutrients everywhere. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So this is the same, the same thing with all drugs is that, you know, the more we can give people things that are more natural, the way um, that L-arginine works, for example, or pro 
a it's it's better for them because it doesn't have any side effects it also um, is more bioavailable in other words it's absorbed quickly through the skin and also it means that you're then not down the road the route of the polypharmacy which is what your dear mum suffered with which is having to take another drug to counteract the effect of that drug and that drug and that drug and that drug Does that makes sense yes there, there is a condition I, I, I can never say the word but it's something like geratricide or something i, I, I can't yes what it's called, but it's something like the third biggest killer in America of people after heart attacks and, and, and strokes and whatnot. And it's the contraindication of drugs, which is, as I say, is what, what got my mum, because my mum's blood pressure was going up and up. She always had low blood pressure when she was younger, which equally is not, not good. We need a balance. Um, but it was going up and up and up to the point where literally she had a bleed, a brain bleed. And um, yeah. She knew she was going to die the day she died. I mean, it was just amazing. And she always said she wanted something that would totally take her out. And, and it did. It was just, she went, yeah. you know, the way that she um, wanted. I'm just looking up um, the source of proarginine, the source of um, allergenine. I used to be able to trot this off. It's, it's some years ago that I used to run these clinics. And I, yeah, I always forget it. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't do the detail. I drive my car, but I don't know how it works. Exactly. Yeah, no, I can't find it easily. So, so there we go. Um, but, but, yeah. but what's sad about this, Elaine, is that, you know, there are so many women who now, even now, are being denied. And it's still in our brains that, OK, I will take some HRT, but I can only take it for five years. Mm. Not true. Not true. Why would you stop taking thyroid after five years? Mm. You know, uh, or whatever it is that you take. This is this is an urban myth. And this is one of the reasons that. I want to talk about this on, on my podcast is because we need this message to go out so that women can empower themselves and challenge the narrative. Uh, and, you know, and sadly, you know, women are still going to GPs and getting a brick wall. But we we now have the ability to go to specialist GPs and practice, uh, nurse practitioners. Um, and I interviewed one of those, you know, they've all got links on my website. So for a, you know, for a, a bit of an investment, you can go and have a proper menopause consultation taking in all to, into all of your other um, risks and benefits and all the other conditions that you might have with somebody who actually knows about HRT and whether or not it's suitable for you and whether or not you need indeed to take little bits of um, testosterone for example because you know I should have been given testosterone at 45 because having a surgical menopause which is the menopause that happens quickly because I'd had my womb removed even though I still have my ovaries it still pushes you into surgical menopause nowadays uh, realistically I should have been offered a little bit of uh, testosterone too because the drop in those three hormones was very dramatic for me is there an online assessment that, that you know of that women could take you mentioned earlier on about if somebody drinks or smokes or or is obese and all these different things, their risk of having more problems during menopause is increased. Is there an online assessment? Do you have something like that on your website or do you know of anywhere that you could point? I don't actually. There is um, there is a lady called Dr. Louise Newston who has an app. I haven't tried it. I don't think she necessarily assesses that, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's necessary because, you know, if we look at intuition, if we look at what we know, you know, when I talk to people about, food and nutrition and i give them advice on what they should eat they know it already elaine they do but it needs people like us to nudge them in the right direction because it's not until you know something drops off that people it's not until the pain is so bad that then people start yeah. the only way is up um, yes yeah. i do i do a lifestyle analysis mm -hmm. um so it's a very similar thing so that's a questionnaire where i ask about i don't know 40 questions or something and that actually shows very clearly which of the systems the, the the nine systems of the body are struggling so yes I do do that that's part of um that's part of my new program which is just being launched actually where I've you know I get so much so can I take um herbal remedies can I what can I take to help me because there is still the mindset that HRT is no good um, so that's fine. It's everybody's decision. So I've put together a, a four part pack of my favorite things that I think are absolutely essential, not only for 
menopause but for women in general so there's a vitamin d3 in there and we all know now how important and vital that is particularly in terms of preventing and recovering from covid19 magnesium is an absolute no-brainer for women who are menopausal everybody should be taking it but particularly at this time proarginine is in there for the reason that we talked about yeah. and there's also my favorite um, menopause supplement because you can get some real rubbish ones from you know the high street and off the internet uh you know supplements aren't um aren't monitored or aren't you know they're not tested for you know they're not um <coughs> monitored like pharmaceuticals are so you could be buying a whole heap of rubbish and wasting your money basically which is why supplements get such a bad name but the one i use and recommend is something called medical dve and it's a, an old-fashioned hop space supplement and actually on one of my websites drjillbarham.com there is an interview with two sisters who've been taking this for i don't know 10 12 years who absolutely swear by it so I've, you know, there are other things, you know, black cohosh and Don Kwai was popular for a while. Some women find sage helpful. I use a, a clary sage doTERRA oil, which some women find helpful. Some women find lavender helping them sleep, but you know, none of it's going to replace the estrogen, but there is some symptomatic relief. And medical, in my opinion, is, um, is the best one of those it's not the one you can get from holland and barrett because like, they stole the name uh, but um so i've put this pack together and alongside that you get an assessment and then every 90 days we look to see how you're doing and what what do we need to adjust what can we take out what can we put in so that's the way that um you know because I, I i do agree with you we want to see results brilliant so um drjillbarham.com and please spell that for the, the listeners because there's various different ways of, I'm sure, spelling. Yes. That <laughs> so my main website is actually www.radiantmenopause.com. Uh, so that's the one to go for the most of the information. I can't remember what I said to you, what was on Dr. Jill Barr and what was on there. That's your, I don't your top favourite things, the, the pack that you just explained. No, I'm going to put that on Radiant Menopause. So oh. probably the simplest thing to do is just to go to radiantmenopause.com because that gives you all the links to the blogs, to the podcasts that you can listen to. And also I'm just loading that uh, particular package onto there. So there's a bit of a one-stop shop, really. You can get to me from there and it links to my Facebook and my Twitter. You can book a 20 minute appointment with me, a free discovery call with me um, to see whether or not, you know, I can help you from that, from that website as well. Brilliant. So it's radiant, excuse me, radiantmenopause.com. Dot com. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute delight speaking with you, Jill, and uh, I'm very happy to have been converted. <laughs> well, let me know how you get on. <laughs> Fantastic. And do share your podcast um, and anything else you'd like to in my group. So my Facebook group is the perfect, it's not the perfect, it's called Perfect Health Wellness Club. Perfect Health Wellness Club. Yeah, perfect Health Wellness Club. Um, I've got uh, approaching 4,000 people on there now. So we've got doctors medics, oncologists, nurses, we've got uh, functional medicine people, naturopaths, uh, and loads of general uh, members of the public. Oh, brilliant. Uh, their expertise and, and so on and so forth. So please. Brilliant. And can I, can I just say one last thing is that the, the one thing that I want to, the only one thing that I want to say to people listening is that what I hear a lot of the time is I've, um, oh, I'm through all of that. If I talk to people about menopause, I'm through all of that is a very common phrase. I don't know if you yes. heard that. You maybe even said it yourself. Yes. Or, you know, I had a bad time, but now I'm okay. Or, or I sailed through it and I'm through all of that and I'm really relieved. What I really want to emphasize here is that you never get through all that. <laughs> you know, the lack of estrogen, although your symptoms may have gone away and you may have stopped your last day of your period and you don't have to worry with all of that, mm -hmm. what you do have to be concerned with is the side effects of withdrawal of estrogen that are potential for you. And just to say that it's estimated that as many as 80% of women ultimately will end up with something like vaginal atrophy. The longer they live, the more they're likely to get it. Although for some women, it's the very first thing they get. And indeed can happen with any drop in estrogen, like after you've had a baby or, you know, after a mastectomy, something like that. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Dr. Jill Barham, radiantmenopause.com. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it.